morning, we'll start the lesson off with some statements of praise. You can say amen to these if you agree with these. First of all, praise God for being a God that we can have confidence in. Praise God that we can have confidence that He has forgiven us of our sins. God knows how to do that. And we know that He has done that for us and that our sins are forgiven as far as the East is from the West. And I want to praise God that He has confidence in us. Amen. It's sort of scary sometimes, isn't it? We didn't get near as many amens on that one. You know, to think about that one for a second, I don't know about that. But yeah, God has confidence in us, and He's given us responsibilities and things that we're supposed to do while we are on this earth. Most of you know I'm from the state of Indiana. One of my favorite movies is Hoosiers, and on, in that movie, they are competing for a state championship in basketball. And the way Indiana used to be is all schools of this, no matter what size you were, all competed in the same state tournament. So if you're a small little school that has 50 kids, you had to go up against the big schools that had thousands of kids. Everybody was in the same tournament. And spoiler alert, the small little school ends up winning the entire championship for the state of Indiana. But when that's happening, they're going through this playoff series and there's this kid on the team he hasn't had a big role in the team that year he started out sort of as the water boy but because of injuries and foul trouble he ends up playing in the game and he's getting ready to shoot two foul shots at the end of the game it's going to give them a chance to go on further into the tournament and the coach has all of the, the students all the players assembled there as he's talking to them and he says when Ollie makes the second free throw and he looks at Ollie and says, you will make the second free throw. He does. And so they're able to go on the next game. But that was the confidence that he didn't have in himself. He needed someone else to look him in the eye and say, I am confident that you are going to make this shot. Sticking with the basketball theme, in one of the times when the Bulls were getting ready to go into the, or win the national championship, in the, in the huddle there, Jordan looked at Steve Kerr and says, they're double teaming me. And if I have to get rid of the ball, I'm going to have to pass it to you. He said, I'll be ready and I'll make it. And so he had confidence in that particular player that he was going to be able to make that shot. Some of you may have seen a letter that has been uh, going around saying it was from a school teacher of Albert Einstein's. I'm not sure if the letter was real, but what is behind the letter was real. The teachers at school thought he had some mental issues. He wasn't able to go to school anymore. And so they basically were writing him off. And it was his mother that said, I'm confident in my son. And she took him and homeschooled him. And it turns out he had a huge influence on society. Sometimes we just need somebody to have confidence in us. We need somebody to put their arm around us and say, I believe in you. I know you can do it. No matter what the devil is telling you, I know you can please God with God's help. That's what I want to talk to you for a few moments this morning. I changed from the thing that we sent out to you yesterday. I wasn't having a good day. I wasn't having a good week with that sermon. And yesterday I emailed to Brian. I just emailed the title. I didn't even email any description. And I, about midday, I was like, I just, I have to do something else. I just, this is not feeling it. I don't think it's going to be good for the congregation for me to preach that sermon. So we're going to deal with this one, and hopefully, I'm confident. <laughs> It'll be helpful to you, because we're going to be reading verses from God's Word. And anytime we open up God's book, and we have an open heart, that can have an influence on us. And I'm confident this lesson will have an influence, because it comes from God's Word. We have a lot of visitors today, and we are so grateful that you're here Hopefully that what you get out of the sermon, you'll be able to take with you in your everyday life. The first point that I want to make here is there's three points that we're going to consider. One, we're going to recognize real potential. Two, showing confidence through words. And then three, showing confidence through actions. Our first point, recognizing real potential. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but I can almost guarantee you all of us have times of this. We lack confidence in ourselves. And we second guess ourselves. You ever have a decision and you're thinking, I don't know, I'm going to make this decision or this decision. And it doesn't matter. It's going to be a bad decision. You know, whatever the case may be. 
We second guess ourselves and we say, I can't do this, or I'm not smart enough to do that, or I'm not good looking enough to do this, or I don't have enough this to do that. We constantly are second guessing ourselves. And God put us in a spiritual family so that we can look at each other and say, quit questioning yourself, trust God. He has given you these talents. He can use you in his service. And Paul did this for Timothy. So we're going to start out in Acts chapter 16. We're going to sort of follow Paul's relationship with Timothy through all three of these points. So Acts chapter 16 and verse 1 says this. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. Verse 2 says he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Paul was impressed by Timothy's reputation. In verse 2 it says, He was well spoken of by the brethren in Lystra, Lystra and Iconium. So as Paul, you just imagine he's going around, he's talking to the brethren there, and he's hearing these whispers about this kid named Timothy, or this young man named Timothy, all these great things he is doing, and how he has known the scriptures from a very early age, and how he is serious. He saw so much potential in this young man, Timothy, that he actually encouraged him to get circumcised so he can take him on his missionary journeys in order to have influence among the Jewish people. Now, that was a big ask. Brian talked about that in the daily Bible reading earlier in January. What a big ask that was for Paul to ask Timothy to go get circumcised at his age so that he could go out and teach. But when Paul looked at him, he goes, I have confidence in this young man. I know that if he is circumcised, it's going to get rid of a, a possible obstacle there, and he is going to be very useful for the Lord. So we ask him to do that, and he does that. Now, I think it's important that we also note this. We all will see potential in people differently. I might not see potential in everybody that you see potential in. And you might see potential in somebody. I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure that, you know, they're going to be very useful. They don't have their head on straight. They're not, they're not very serious about the Lord, whatever. And then you look at them and say, no, I see this in them. And that's another reason why the spiritual family is so important. You know, Paul sees this huge amount of potential in Timothy. And at one point, he doesn't see it in John Mark. And it's Barnabas that sees it in John Mark. And later, Paul comes and says, you know what? Maybe he does have potential. He could be helpful to me as well. So as God's people in a spiritual location, we all need to be looking for potential in one another and then verbalizing that potential as well. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance nor at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance and the Lord looks at the heart. When God is looking for potential, he starts with people's heart. That's important because the heart can do a lot of things that skills cannot do. Potential is found first in a person's heart and not in a person's skill set. I think that's important. Sometimes we look at things wrong, too. Just like Samuel was and just like the children of Israel, we're looking for a king. We're looking for somebody. All right. As Brian pointed out a little bit in our class, I'm looking for the person who can speak the best. I'm looking for Aaron, right? Aaron has a better mind. He's a better person than Aaron, Moses because he can speak better. We might be looking, hey, I want to look for somebody who's extremely intelligent. That is the number one thing. The person who has the most potential is the person who is the smartest. And it may be the person you might think the person who has the, the most potential is the person who has all these talents. Or maybe the person who has the most potential to do good for God is the person who has the biggest bank account. None of those things are the important things when it comes to potential. What's important is what we find in a person's heart. The Bible talks about guarding our heart. As parents, we are, we are always looking 
at our children's hearts to see if their hearts are in tune with God's heart. Not necessarily are they getting straight A's or are they the most intelligent person in the room, but are their hearts right? Because that's where potential really is. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 16, nothing points this out more than the people Jesus selected to turn the world upside down. He wasn't selecting the people with the greatest amount of talent. You imagine if they had this board up here and Jesus was going to write down, all right, let's write down all the qualities we're looking for to turn the world upside down. And if, if that were a human list, it would not look anything like Jesus did. He would take that board and he would just throw it aside or take a piece of paper and crumple up. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who are willing to make decisions to follow me regardless of cost. Everything else I can work in to all of this. So Mark chapter 1 verse 16 says this, And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will be make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James and John, his brother, and also where they were mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. These men had limited skill sets to turn the world upside down for Christ. They were good fishermen, maybe decent businessmen. They could mend nets. They could cast them into the sea. But as far as we know, they obviously, all Jews at the time, had some kind of knowledge of the law of God, but they weren't the people that most of us would have chosen. Mark chapter 2, if you continue on in the text, verse 13, it says, Then he went out to the region of the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened... As he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats with and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." These men that Jesus called, they did something that many other people didn't do that made them have potential. They had a desire to leave and follow. Leave everything they had behind and follow Jesus. That's what gave them potential. There are a lot of people in the world, probably, in the church who might be great preachers, but they're not willing to leave their secular jobs or leave security or leave that or, or, or enter in the possibility, I may have to move a lot in order to be a, an evangelist. You know what? What Jesus is looking for? Those who are willing to leave and follow. If I can find someone who can leave and follow, who will put it all down, then I can use that person, even if they don't have the most talent, even if they're not the smartest guy in any room they ever go to, even if they're not very good at articulating themselves, I can use somebody who's willing to be used. That's the people that have the greatest potential for God. Not everybody has to be a preacher, but everybody has to have the attitude. Every Christian has to have the attitude, I'm willing to leave this earth and the material things of this life and use everything I have for the Lord. And if we're not willing to do that, then we, we lack the potential that God can use. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Potential, and we have to understand this, potential doesn't lie in people. Potential lies in God's desire and God's ability to use people. You know, because, you know, to be honest, if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, I think you have a lot of potential and you can do this and you can do that and all this good stuff, that's going to be overwhelming to most of us, isn't it? But if they say, I see that God can use you in his service 
And that God has the potential to take you and your talents and make you beneficial and useful to others. That's where it really starts to hit home for us. So let's go to our second point. We need to be able to show people that we have confidence. Not only do we see the confident, the potential they have, but vocalize that potential to them. Because if I think you have potential, or if you think I have potential, but we never share that with one another, we're robbing each other of actually living up to that potential. People have to know that when they see potential in us, they have to vocalize that so we know they see that, so we can look for that same potential. We're looking at Timothy again, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul sees potential in Timothy. This young man can do a lot for the Lord. He has a solid foundation in his Bible knowledge. He had good parents, a mother and a grandmother that taught him great things. He has potential, and he tells them this. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be fulfilled with joy. When I call to remembrance... The genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Paul saw this great deal of potential in Timothy, and as he's writing this letter to him, he tells Timothy, I see something in you. I see a genuine faith in God. Timothy needed to hear that because life, uh, I think Emory in his prayer this, uh, this morning, he said life is hard. Life is difficult. It's filled with challenges that we all have to face. And sometimes somebody looking at us and saying, you know what? I see something different in you. I see that you mean this. I see that this is important to you. I see that this isn't just... You're not just going through the motions. You really have a genuine faith and trust in God, and that will make you useful for him. He also reminded Timothy of what we talked about just a second ago, that God was giving him the spirit of love and of power and a sound mind. It wasn't himself having to get all this mustered up on his own. God is with you, Timothy. I see God with you. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Paul used his words to assure Timothy that it is the power of God working through him. So when we do vocalize to other people the confidence that we have in them, make sure we're coupling that with the power of God working through them. You're not on an island. You don't have to muster up all this potential on your own. God is working through you to do all of these wonderful things. I like what, how much confidence Paul had. In Philemon, Philemon uh, verses 21 and 22. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Paul told Philemon that he had confidence that he would go beyond what I'm even asking. You know people like that. You know people like that. Well, you, could, you could say, I knew you were going to come through. I mean, I just had no doubt that what I was asked of you, this project that I assigned you or this thing that you were overseeing, that you would not only take it seriously and you would not only do it well, but you would do it better than I even thought. I had so much confidence in you. And, and notice something else he says here. I'm confident that I'm going to be brought back to you through your prayers. Some of you in this audience and some people that we know are prayer warriors for the rest of us. And there's some of you that the rest of us can go to and say, 
I know if you're praying for me, I can have extra confidence because I know who you are and I know your relationship with God. You probably have done that in the past, haven't you? Have you ever had an issue that you were going through in life and sought a particular person out or a group of people out that you had a lot of confidence in and say, I need some pretty serious prayers right now and I've chosen you. I'm not telling everybody this, but I've chosen you because I have confidence that you can go before the throne of God on my behalf and that God will listen to you. Isn't it good that the children of Israel had somebody like that in Moses? We need more Moseses who can go to God on our behalf because their prayer, prayer life is the way that it needs to be. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day into now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much both in my chains and defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of God's grace. I'm going to stop the reading there. Paul was verbally motivating them by telling them he was confident that God was going to complete the good work he had started in them. And he commended them for sharing the gospel, not uh, having fellowship in the gospel. Parents. Being a parent is the hardest, scariest job in the entire world. It's not for the weak of heart. I am confident that with God's help, you can raise your children in a way that is pleasing to God. Amen. You can't do it on your own. You will fail miserably. I'm telling you that right now. But with God's help, you can do it. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to want to throw your hands up. And you're going to, you're going to probably think this a couple times in your life. Why did God give me these children? I have no idea what I'm doing. He gave them to you because he trusts you and he has confidence in you and he knows that he can help you and he knows that the people in this room can help you. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't get weary and well-doing. Don't think it can't happen. It can. If you continue to persist, you have the ability with God's help. Our third point. Showing confident through actions. It's one thing to tell a player if you were coaching a basketball team, I have confidence in you, I have confidence in you, I have confidence in you. Hey, why don't you shoot the last shot? Right? In other words, I can tell you all day long I have confidence in you, but unless I'm going to let the quarterback make the pass or unless I'm going to call the play so that you get to shoot the shot at the last second, I really don't have confidence in you, right? I have co more confidence in the other guy. It's important for us to understand that when we show confidence in our kids and in one another, sometimes that is the only way that that really hits hard is when they're given the responsibility to do something and you take a couple steps back and let them do it. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. We're back to Timothy again. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Paul showed real confidence in Timothy when he left him in Ephesus to make sure their doctrine was pure. So, so it's like this with Timothy. Hey, Timothy, man, I know you have, a, you have a good knowledge of the Scripture, and I know that you have good wisdom, and I know I have a lot of confidence in you. I'm going to leave someone else in Ephesus to do that, though. I don't have that much confidence in you. See how confidence has to be followed up by responsibility? It can't be just words. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. When I needed something important done, I saw your potential. I had confidence in it. But now it's time to take that potential 
and actually use it for the Lord. I'm giving you a very important task. I'm not even going to be there. I'm leaving you in charge of that. You can handle that on your own. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 21, it says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit that he was, had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, was going to go to Jerusalem. After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia. Two of those who ministered with him, Timothy, was one of those guys. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So he was going to, I need you to go ahead of me to do that without me being there. I trust you enough to send you to prepare the way. Isn't that what Jesus had to do for the disciples, with the disciples in the limited commission? I am sending you before me to go to all these cities to prepare the way for me. He does this also for another young man, Titus, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So Paul showed confidence in Titus by leaving him in Crete to appoint elders in every church. You know what? I think that if I were given that task... My eyes would be about that big, and I'd say, I don't think you got the right guy, you know. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty hefty task. Paul saw that he had the potential. He knew his character. He told them he had, he had potential, he had confidence. Then he says, here's what you're going to do. I'm giving you a task to do to show you that I have that confidence. Titus was also to set in order the things that were lacking. So I have confidence. You can go to the church, you can, set up, you can help appoint elders, and then you can set everything in order for the churches there. What's the lacking? Boy, that was a lot of responsibility given to someone. And yet he was able to do it because God was helping him. In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 24, this is when he's getting, Moses is getting the, uh, the advice from Jethro. It says, So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. <coughs> Moses had to learn something. He had to learn to show confidence in other people to benefit the nation by actually giving them real responsibility. That was hard. Because sometimes if you're a leader and you've been leading the people for a long time, you think you're the only one that could do it. I'm not saying Moses thought that, but sometimes you do. It's important if you're really trying to develop people and help them reach their potential that you not only tell them, not only see the potential, recognize the potential was our first point, verbalize the potential that you see in them, and then give them responsibility so that potential could be useful for the Lord and then they themselves could see that God can use me to do good things for His service, some things by way of practical application. We all need to be people who are looking for potential. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought you need to be someone looking for potential? And, and I, I'm challenging all of us to do that. I want us to look out in not only our kids, but the entire congregation and see how much potential we have in this room right now. It's a bunch. So I, I, I think our, our mindset needs to shift sometimes because if we're not careful... The devil wins the battle in our mind. And we start seeing people and we don't see their potential. We just see their sins. Or we just see their limitations. We need to decide, I'm going to stop seeing people's limitations. And I am going to start seeing their potential that they have to be useful for God with God helping them. Can we do that as a way of practical application? Quit looking for people's limits and their limitations look for their potential, and then verbalize that potential to them. That might be awkward at first. And, you know, you might say, I, I haven't really told anybody that I see potential in them or this, that, or there. It might be odd. Just do it. Do it small. Do it in a letter. I'm going to give you another idea you can use in just a second. And then if you have an opportunity to work with them on something, you know, I see, I see this potential in you. I think you could be a good Bible class teacher. Would you teach that Bible class with me? Things of that nature could be very, very helpful. I think we've tried this a little bit in the past. And I want to try to re, rejuvenate it a little bit. 
I have some I appreciate pieces of paper out there. And so these can be very helpful to one another. Just write down something. I appreciate something in you. I see something in you that's beneficial. You can hand it to him or you can post it in the back. So this isn't intended to embarrass anybody. I hope it doesn't. But I appreciate Steve Davis. He always has a great response when I ask him how he's doing. He usually says fantastic or fabulous or something similar. Today, when I asked him how he was doing, he said, marvelous. I always look forward to asking him how he's doing because I don't know what he's going to say. And I look forward to that and I appreciate the fact that he has that attitude and he doesn't say, oh, I'm doing awful. I've had a lot of bad things that happened to me today. You can almost always count on Steve to give you a good word when asked how he's doing. I appreciate Irene Geiger because she encourages me with her beautiful smile and encouraging words, cards that she sends. When I first got here, it was mask time, right? People were wearing masks. And it took me a while before I got to see Irene smile. You know, it was several months, maybe even six months. But then one day she showed up to services and she didn't have her mask on. And I talked to her and I saw her smile and her smile just brightened my day a little bit. So I appreciate that she smiles when she's here and she sends so many cards out. There's so many uh, treasures in heaven that she has because she has encouraged so many people. And I appreciate Terry Petty because most of you don't know all of this, but he has spent so much effort putting these two air conditioners in these rooms here. And these are on his days off. He can't just leave his work and say, I'm going to go do this. He'd be out here on Saturdays, he'd be out here late, he'd be out here when he has a few minutes digging trenches to put wiring through. So, Terry, I appreciate you so much for all the work you do around here. Not only potential, but man, you live up to that potential all the time. And I appreciate Jared and Ann because they are wonderful parents and faithful Christians, and they are great examples to us all. So there's sheets back there for every, anybody else. So this is my next practical thing. Take one sheet of paper, okay? One sheet of paper. Think about potential that somebody has or something that you see and th that they're already doing well and just tell them that. Tell them that you can put it on the board if you want and we can all read them and, and maybe uh, I have my name signed to here. Maybe you don't have, want to put your name, but maybe you put that in the back and everybody signs it, right? Yeah, I agree with that too. Resigning the same sheet of paper could be your way of saying amen. I appreciate those things too. As God's people, we can have confidence in one another, but most importantly, we can have confidence in God. God loves us so much that He sent His only Son, His only begotten Son, down to this earth to shed His blood so that we could be forgiven. Jesus followed through perfectly. And now we stand here, we sit here, we sit here as forgiven people. And we get confidence that God can do that. And I am confident that God can forgive your sins. And He can make you a different person. He can make you think differently. He can make you act differently. He can change everything about you to look more like His Son. And if you want that for your life, and if you know what you need to do to be washed in the blood of Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, we can baptize you today. If you don't know and you just want to study some more, we can do that as well. If we can help anyone, we ask you to come as we stand and sing.